Welcome everyone to part 4 of the Exploring the City series. In this episode, we will be covering miscellaneous information not covered in the rest of the series. This video will contain extra big spoilers for both Lobotomy Corporation and Library of Arena, as I will have to spoil the main plot of Lobcorp and its real ending. You have been warned. The White Knights and Dark Days event is a large catalyst for everything post Lobotomy Corporation. Manager X, who is actually Aeon, the founder of Lobotomy Corporation, completes the Seed of Light project. He used the TT2 protocol on a repeating loop for thousands of years until it was performed perfectly. Ultimately, he had gathered all the light they needed for Carmen's dream to come to fruition. Carmen wished to cure the mental sickness suffered by everyone in the city. However, this process was interrupted by Angela, the AI crafted from Carmen's identity. She had been running this script for thousands of years, all while processing time a hundred times slower than a human. Forced to repeat this futile loop for what seemed like an eternity caused her to grow extremely jaded and cruel. Due to the TT2 protocol, though, all of this occurred in only ten years of real time. Angela successfully stole the light, interrupting the process that was giving the light to every resident in the city. She hoarded away a lot of it for herself in an attempt to become a real human, while only a portion of the light meant for the city was dispersed. This results in the process being incomplete, and instead of having the intended result, it awakened the distortion phenomena. This goes on to be one of the largest events going forward in the timeline. Last classified as an urban nightmare, we are pretty sure this has been recently exalted to a star of the city. Distortion phenomenon events occur when people fall into strong surges of emotion, turning them into monsters, and often killing many people as a result. It occurs most commonly around the ruins of El Corp's previous nests. These monsters that form because of the distortion phenomenon are, aptly, referred to as distortions. Those that undergo extreme mental stress or emotional blocks are left with two options, be consumed by their emotions, or resolve. Those that are consumed and fall to their ill feelings physically distort, often with imagery connected to their woes. Those that stay resolute gain an ego, and only a few people have successfully completed their ego. Ego can come in two forms, complete and incomplete. Incomplete ego is where one is going through the process of realizing one's true self and wholly accepting it. Incomplete is a much stronger version that comes with the mastery of truly accepting oneself and relinquishing all the doubts they had before. The only person we know about who had completed the process before the events of Library of Arena was Callie, the Red Mist. Other ego we have seen so far include Angela's, Ezra, Ty, Virgil, Zhao, and Yuria's. I hesitate to call Ezra as a complete ego since she still needs the aid of Yuria to complete it. Philip attempted to manifest an ego and was on the verge of completing his, but he was shot down at the last minute and distorted instead. Little bitch. We later learn at the end of Library of Arena that Carmen is the voice of the distortion. She has achieved a metaphysical state of nigh godhood and is quite different in her attitude than we had previously seen. In a stark contrast to the well meaning Good Samaritan everyone spoke of before, Carmen seeks to distort everyone at every given chance claiming she will stop at nothing until the city folk learn to love their true selves. Angela promises to stop her for as long as she is part of the light. There is also another form of ego that the Lobotomy Corporation managed to manufacture. However, I must first explain abnormalities, another one of the Lobotomy Corporation's products. Abnormalities are, as their name suggests, a type of abnormal entity that can be used to generate power. Each is given a classification using letters, numbers, and a nickname based on their appearances and abilities. Run by Bina in the Extraction Department, abnormalities are created by combining a person with Kogito. Because of this, they vary in terms of danger, strength, and usefulness. Workers can then extract energy from them through specific interactions. Lobotomy Corporation possessed a variety of abnormalities, having used them for study, power generation, and the creation of Ego Gear. Each is ranked on a threat scale from Zayan to Aleph. Aleph itself is so fast that there is a clear definition of power between Aleph's themselves. Example being that of nothing there, while being nothing to sneeze at, is nothing compared to White Knight or Apocalypse Bird. They pose as the main antagonist of Lobotomy Corporation during its events. All of the abnormalities are unique and each pose a different threat. There are also beings known as aberrations, which are variations of existing abnormalities similar to how flora and fauna have subspecies. Another byproduct produced, and dear lords, are there so many byproducts, are the ordeals. Opposition faced by the facility in Lobotomy Corporation ordeals with the offspring of failed attempts at creating abnormalities, horrible nightmares suffered by Aeon that were brought to life. 
So, while some ordeals might be sweepers, they are not real in the sense that they came from the city, rather Aeon's horrible memories of them. Categorized into six colors, amber, crimson, indigo, green, violet, and white, each has their own story to their creations. Amber follows a group of abnormally large insects that forever hunger and seek to consume everything in their path, including themselves. Crimson brings in a group of horribly delusional clowns, seeking to spread their fun to those that don't realize how pointless life is without their enlightenment. It is unknown if they have ties to a certain clown we see in Library of Arena, as they share a very similar visual motif. Green observes a group of really, really, really sad boy robots that, in their attempt to find their creator, realize that if they must be forced to suffer, so should everyone else. Violet notes on a coalition of individuals that sought to understand an eldritch god. Being exactly that, though, they failed at every turn to understand exactly what they were shown. However, they were so deeply enthralled that they refused to accept anything other than their false understandings. They would try at anything to commune with their god, which ended up leading to a Terran reality summoning their god to our world. White ordeals are unique in that they are more prophetic than the others. There are countless theories as to what's going on with the ordeals following days 46 to 50, but one thing is clear, they are vastly different from anything you've encountered before. Because of them, fixers start to invade the company. These fixers bear the title of Book Hunters, something Aeon would not have been even remotely aware of since it refers to a particular ending of Library of Arena. Some believe they are real, and only enter the facility so close to the end of the game because the facility is beginning to emerge from the ground. I don't follow this line of logic, as the facility is only ever shown leaving the ground on day 50, and there are far too many timeline breaks to even think of Book Hunters showing up at this point in time. Back to the point of Ego, one byproduct of abnormalities is Ego Equipment. These are very powerful forms of armor and weapons extracted from an abnormality. They impart all the same abilities that one would have if they manifested Ego by themselves, simply by wearing the given item. If one doesn't have the correct mental or physical fortitude to wear one, however, they will suffer Ego Corrosion and fall into madness and die. Maybe just die if they're lucky. One does not need any formal training with weapons when using Ego Equipment. A sensation described as a voice speaking to the user in their mind has been recorded, guiding them on how to use the equipment effectively. While originally thought to be a distortion associated with the phenomenon, the library was actually proved to be Angela's ego. It was at this point that the head declared the library as an impurity of the city and could no longer abide Angela's existence in the city. Promptly teleporting the whole of the library, and the ruins of Lobotomy Corp's nest, to the outskirts. That should cover the basic of distortions and ego for now. There are plenty more examples and much more to go into, but this series is simply a cursory view and a jumping off point for getting into the world. Up next are the workshops of the city. The merchants that fixers and syndicates alike go to are known as workshops. Workshops are self-reliant equipment manufacturers that sell specialized equipments and items. Exceptionally skilled craftsmen are called Meisters, but this might be a self-appointed title. Of all the crazy things that exist in the city, unions exist for workshops. These allow workshops to work with extra certification of identity, as well as adding an extra flair to their items. In order to produce firearms or ammunition, they must acquire a very difficult to obtain license. Apparently, it is common for a workshop to work under one who already has the license. All workshop technology is patented. Anyone who breaks these patents is sent to cease and desist up to three times. Upon receiving these requests, the workshop must then stop their production and turn over all profits made from the infringed product. At the third request, the head is no longer asking and will be sending a claw to kill all those involved in producing the fraudulent inventory. Examples of products vary from workshop to workshop. Each seeks to stand out and have their own leg in the industry, hence why the patents are so important. Workshops, through deals, can utilize singularities, or have their own amazing tech that simply isn't on the level of those megacorps. Examples of such tech include gauntlets that can accelerate one's fist up to five times the regular velocity, a hammer that can increase the magnitude of its swing several fold, and conducting heat wire through a blade among many more. Yuria Atelier is a self-proclaimed workshop meister. Currently, she holds allegiance with the distortion detective Moses in said office. She can easily produce up to a dozen pieces of equipment in a week, including night vision goggles and an exoskeleton. She makes use of a psychomint, her ego, as she is not aware of the body corpse terminology, to do so. She has fabricated an entire factory of teddy bears who craft all sorts of items at her command. Yuria has sworn to investigate Psychomint as much as possible, hence her fascination with Ezra and Moses. 
The level of the city's day-to-day -day technology has been shown to span multiple eras. We know that creations, such as the internet, exist, as online schooling is a thing. Television and broadcasts are common and can be observed in Wonder Lab, showing both news bulletins and cartoons, but there is also the use of singularities, which are far beyond anything available today, and people who still use pagers to communicate. One last note to end this series on, the city doesn't appear to hold any form of gender norms or apparel. Many examples of gender neutral people have been shown across the series, primarily observed in Wonder Lab. The whole cast is referred to using strictly neutral terms. Even the names across the series go against the norms. We see male presenting characters with traditionally female names and vice versa. It is never commented on as odd or in a place. The names also come in a variety of influences from across the real world and cultures. As far as we can tell, everyone seems to speak the same language, save for sweepers who have their own unique language. Different dialects are shown to exist though, such as with the smiling face syndicate. If anyone was to discriminate amongst denizens of the city, it would most certainly come from class structure before gender or representation. Well, that'll cover the city for now. Watching the series, spoilers and all, should have you plenty prepared for Limbus Company. I still highly recommend consuming all of Project Moon media firsthand. Gather your own information, perhaps some that I didn't even cover here, or might have missed. The series is only a second-hand source for info, and there's a very good chance that a lot becomes outdated or disproven in future installments as the franchise grows. A lot of information is tucked away in Library of Arena's book descriptions, as well as the literature of Distortion Detective, Leviathan, and Winter Lab being a bit hidden away on Project Moon's website. I'll provide links in the description to all first-hand sources I gleaned from and how to get access to the age-restricted content on Project Moon's website. I hope you enjoy the series, and I don't add these requests to my videos, but if you found this series useful, drop a like or leave a comment so I know that I should continue putting out content like this. If you really enjoy my personality, or anything in particular about these videos, please subscribe, as I look forward to moving forward with many more topics about video games, including more Project Moon subjects. Happy New Year, Sinners!